for introduction. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here to uh, kick off proceedings today. Um, I want you to do me a favour. I want you to imagine what it's like to be an elite gymnast. Okay? For some of you, it's probably a little bit harder than others. Okay? <laughs> but I want you to imagine, to help you imagine, I want you to take 14 years off your life. Let's go back to the year 2000. Okay, so it's the summer of 2000. You are all elite gymnasts. You are in the best physical condition that you've ever been. You've trained for maybe 10 to 12 years to get to this point, two to three times a day, five to six days a week. You're so good that you're the British champion. There's no one better than you in the country. You are the best gymnast in the country. You're so good that you've won two of the three Olympic trials. You pretty much guarantee your spot on that flight to Sydney. The one spot that is available for a British gymnast. So it's July the 5th. It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday afternoon. You're training. You're coming towards the end of the third training session of the day. And you're working on a very simple routine. You're just working through that routine. And at 5.45, you slip. Your fist punches into the ground. Two bones break in your hand. And your dreams of being an Olympian have just disappeared. On September the 20th, 2000, I'm asleep in bed. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. And my home phone rings. And when your home phone rings at that time of night, you worry, don't you? So I scrabble around, I pick the phone up, and I immediately recognise the voice on the other end of the phone. And in a broad Burnley accent, they say, Nick, I am in the Olympic final. James Kerr has written a great book called Legacy, and he charts the development of the all-black rugby team, how they create a legacy. And my role, working with athletes and sports and teams, is essentially to make sure that they realise their potential, to make sure that when I finish working with an athlete or a team, they're in a better position than when I started with them. So in a very small way, I try and create sporting legacies. What I want to share with you today are the skills and attributes of the support staff that work with that gymnast, that work with those teams on an ongoing basis to try and create those legacies. And I'm going to share that with you over about the next 10 to 15 minutes. Now, I reckon everyone in this room is quite intelligent, okay? So we all know that a tomato is a fruit, right? We all know a tomato is a fruit. I know a tomato is a fruit. But don't worry, because if you come round to my house for dinner, I'm not going to put it in a fruit salad. Because I know that even though it's a fruit, it will taste pretty nasty in a fruit salad. Okay? Now what I've demonstrated there is the first thing that a great coach, that someone that wants to create legacies has to have. They have to have great knowledge. Okay? But there's two types of knowledge. There's intellectual intelligence, book smarts, knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Aren't we clever? But then what's most important, the coaches that really make an impact are the ones that have the street smarts, the experience, that know that, yeah, all right, clever clogs, it's a tomato and it's a fruit, but I'm not putting in a fruit salad. And the coaches that have had the biggest impact throughout my career, watching them working with athletes, are the ones that are technically very gifted. They understand the sport, they understand their area of expertise really well, but the ability they have is to actually communicate that message and have an impact and get it across effectively. So they blend the street smarts and the book smarts, because there's a huge difference between knowing and doing. So that's the first quality that I think they need to possess. The next thing is that all great coaches are cockroaches. Okay, now cockroaches isn't really something you probably want to associate yourself with and say, I aspire to be a cockroach, <laughs> right? You, but here's the reason why you do. The reason why you all want to be like cockroaches in order to create a legacy is because cockroaches were knocking around the earth around about the same sort of time as dinosaurs, okay, millions of years ago. Now, on my way here, as I came down the quayside, I didn't see any dinosaurs, okay? They've died out a long time ago. However, I'm sure if we look closely enough, we would find lots of cockroaches. Not only cockroaches, but cockroaches that have adapted to the urban environment that they live in. If you go around the world, there will be different species and different types of cockroaches. They are flexible and adaptable. 
great coaches that leave legacies have to be flexible and adaptable. They have to be open-minded. Not so open-minded that their brains fall out, but they have to be open to change. They have to accept criticism, take on advice, and put that into practice. So I'd encourage you all to be cockroaches. Now, there are two types of people in the world. You're either a hen or you're a pig. All right? <laughs> now, the hen, to lay an egg, that's kind of involved in the process. Okay? I want an egg for my breakfast. No problem, Nick. I'll give you an egg. It sits on the nest, pops out an egg. I'll have, I'll have another one tomorrow. I'll give you two, Nick. I can give you two tomorrow. It's no problem. I'm involved. I'll do it all day long. <laughs> it's involved. The pig, on the other hand, I got to the pig, all right? I'd like some bacon for my breakfast. Now, he's got a decision to make because there's only one way that bacon is getting into my full English. The pig has to decide if it's committing to the task because it's either in or it's out. And to really have an impact, you have to commit. I found out I was a pig around about the first week of that rehab process working with that gymnast because he tested my commitment. Came in and said, Nick, uh, just to let you know, Friday I'm going to go down and see Oasis in concert in London. Right, you do know you've got a broken hand, don't you? Yeah, it's all right, I'm going to drive with the other one and my girlfriend's going to change gear for us. <laughs> right, well that's about 150 miles, it's not the greatest thing to do. And have you ever been to an Oasis concert? They're not the most genteel fans in the world. So I explained on various levels why that was the dumbest thing that I'd heard him say. And he, he said some dumb things in, in the time. <laughs> but that was, that was up there with them, okay? And he tested my commitment. He said, I'll tell you what then, if I get you a ticket, if I sort out accommodation, you can drive my car, will you take me down there on your weekend off, make sure that I'm okay, make sure I don't get into any bother, and get me back. And I'd said to him, when he first broke his hand, that we'll, we'll get you to the Olympics, we'll do everything we can. So it was at that point I decided I was a pig. I was in. I was doing it. So we went and saw Oasis. So you've got to decide now whether you're going to be a hen or whether you're going to be a pig. Because I think to be successful in business, as a parent, in, in sport, you have to commit. You can't just dip your toe in the water. Every now and then, you have to shake your pom-poms. Okay? Uh, working in sport, you would imagine that every athlete must be highly motivated, must want to always uh, be up for the challenge. Um, most recently, uh, working with the GB women's basketball team prior to Olympics, we had a few sessions left. Uh, we went into the training uh, gym and the mood was, it was like a morgue. It was, it was just completely stone cold dead. It was flat. I think the realisation that this big thing that we'd planned for for four years was actually going to be happening. And the coach came up and said, look, Nick, we've, we've got like two or three sessions left. I can't afford for them not to have their head in the game. So I don't care what you do for the next 10 minutes, you just need to get them ready for this session, because it's an important session. No pressure, thanks coach. So it was at that point I reached for my emergency pom-poms and I shook them hard and I shook them long. So <laughs> we played a game for 10 minutes. It was a game that I'd learned only a few weeks earlier. My, at the time, seven-year-old daughter, Erin, taught me this game along with the assembled brownie pack. And it was the bean game. Now, the bean game, I don't know if any, anyone's parents, they might know this, is a ridiculous game. Basically, there are various beans. There are Mexican beans, there are French beans, jumping beans, running beans, broad beans, baked beans, jelly beans, and they all have associated actions to them. Okay? So I had the country's best athletes that were going to be competing the, on the biggest stage of their life, running around a gym, pretending to be different beans. So I'd shout out running bean and they'd run on the spot. I'd shout out jelly bean, they'd wobble like jellies. French beans, ooh la la, they'd all shout. <laughs> <coughs> I get paid to do this as well. <laughs> but for 10 minutes, at the end of that session, the pressure had lifted. They were ready to take instruction from the coach. So when you want to work with people and you want to try and inject some motivation, sometimes it's your job to do it. Sometimes you have to raise your level. You have to raise the game. You have to be the motivator. If you want to get the most out of your employees, if you want to get the most out of your kids, the most out of the athletes, sometimes you've got to bring the energy to it. So you've got to shake your pom-poms. 140 characters or less. Okay? You've got to be able to tweet. To be effective, communication is really, really important. Okay? What does a fridge do? Okay? Apart from keeping your food cold, a fridge 
sits in the corner of the room and sets out a low level hum constantly. There's a noise coming out of that fridge all day long, all day, all night, but none of you will hear that noise because you've tuned out. I've worked with coaches that are fridges. They just talk and talk and talk. It's noise. It is verbal drivel. No one's listening anymore. Matthew Pinson recalls a story where he worked with Jürgen Grobler. Jürgen Grobler is one of the greatest uh, rowing coaches ever. And Matthew Pinson's previous coaches were fridges. They'd row down the river and they wouldn't hear anything that they were saying. Jürgen Grobler started on his first session and the guys are rowing down the river. They can't hear him. He's not said a word. They keep rowing. He still hasn't said a word. They keep rowing. They think he's fallen in. They get to the turnaround point. The boat comes over to the side. And at that point, Jürgen Grobler gives them two or three key points, sets them back on the way, go and do it. And that's the key of effective communication, is making sure that it's not your time to show how clever you are and how much knowledge you've got. It's knowing what are the one or two things that I need to say that's going to have an impact and make a difference. So you've got to learn to tweet. You've got to be an effective communicator. Don't be a fridge. Don't be Charlie Brown's teacher, Mrs. Donovan. Remember Mrs. Donovan? <laughs> wah, wah, wah. You know, the kids are dropping off and giving it Zs. Don't be a fridge or Charlie Brown's teacher. One of the key things is we need to be role models. We, you know, in whatever we do, parenting, sport, business, what you say and what you do have to match. Now, I've made an observation on my Sunday bike rides with my family. I've made an observation I'm going to share with you. Now, when I go out for my bike rides, there are three types of family that I've, I've observed. Okay? The first type, my family, the Granthams. We go out for a bike ride. Little Joe, he's got a helmet on. Erin, she's wearing a cycle helmet. Daddy, Mummy, both wearing cycle helmets. I've realised that what's in here is fairly important. I don't want it spilling out over the pavement. So I understand that. We all wear cycle helmets. Now, I see a family coming towards me. They're a little bit edgy. They've probably got better haircuts than me, so they don't wear helmets. <laughs> none of them have got helmets on. Now, I kind of get that, because none of them are wearing cycle helmets. Then there's a third family. Now, this is, these are the weirdos. Because the third family, the two kids are wearing cycle helmets, and the mum and dad aren't wearing cycle helmets. Now, I know how the conversation would have worked if it was me trying to do that. I'd have said to my kids, put your cycle helmet on. Well, you're not wearing one, Dad, so why should I? So when you work with athletes, when you work in business, when you work with your kids, you have to make sure that what you say and what you do match. Otherwise, it's very difficult to try and create that impact and create that legacy. So you really need to make sure that you walk the talk. And the final quality that I think all great coaches, all great people need to possess is patience. Patience is absolutely crucial, particularly in the, in the sport arena. Okay? Um, John Wooden was a great basketball coach uh, from UCLA, and he talks about the glory is in getting there. Okay? When you work with athletes, you tend to work over a four-year cycle, maybe an eight-year cycle, so you're in for the long haul to create an Olympian. And to do that, you sometimes have to recognise that you might have an input right at the start, midway through. Chances are you won't be there when they stand on the podium when they've won. But the glory isn't in getting there, it's, it's knowing your part to create that legacy. I wonder what John Wooden would make of someone like John Terry. For those of you who don't know John Terry, rather well, infamously, over the last two years, 2012 2013, was what's termed a full kit Wally. He went to the European Championships where they won trophies and he wore his suit because he took no part in the actual game, the deciding game. But miraculously, when they got the winner's trophy, he'd stripped down to full kit, down to the shin pads. Even his football boots had emblazoned the logo and the name of the, the event. Your personal glory is secondary to that of the team. Don't be a full kit Wally. Okay? The glory is in getting there. Just know that you've had your part somewhere along the line to create that difference. So for me, whilst undoubtedly the coaches, the sports scientists, the support crew that work in sport are very technically gifted, 
I think Seth Godin in his book Lynchpin sums it up really nicely for me and says, actually, that's a given. Everyone's got technical expertise. But what's really important is that you work on the interactions, the subtle, the less tangible things. That's what really makes the connection and develops the legacy. So remember, if you come to my house, you're not going to get a tomato in your fruit salad. All right? That we should all aspire to be cockroaches, be flexible and be adaptable. <coughs> Commit. Because if you want to make a difference, there's no time for just being involved in the periphery. It's not going to work. Get those pom-poms out, shake them long, shake them hard, be proud. Tweet, 140 characters or less. Make sure that your actions and your words match. Walk the talk. And please, don't be a full kit Wally. Remember that your glory is secondary to that of the cause. I'd like to thank these guys. These are my coaches. These are my sports scientists. These are all the people that I've worked with over the years that have shaped, I guess, my legacy of, of me being a coach. So it's, it would be remiss of me not to thank them. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for, for coming here today. And before I finish, if any of you are interested to know, well, how did that gymnast actually get on in the Olympic finals and what's their legacy and what are they doing? Well, over coffee, you can ask, because he's in the second row, Craig Heap, Olympic gymnast. Thank you very much for your talk.